Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivis. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. And today we're going to talk about something that I see pretty much everybody who started a ketogenic journey taking something off. Pretty much everybody I see is on some form of electrolyte replacement. They're taking magnesium, they're taking, and we'll go through that in a little bit, they're taking potassium, they're taking uh, minerals, vitamins, trace elements, they're taking their salts, they're taking a variety, zinc is a big popular one since COVID. They're taking all these things that they've heard on the internet that have some magical, mystical properties. And ah, man, it's an industry. And I'm not sure on a, on a well-formulated carnival-based diet, even if you're eating a lot of plants, that that's actually necessary. Absolutely, without a question, it is important to get electrolytes in. But can't we get them in in our food? Can't we get them in as a food additive, as something we eat, so we don't have to sit there with a lineup of pills as if we're sick? It, 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 I know there are people that love to pop pills. I, how they can be fat, I don't know, because they're so busy taking pills. They must be full after their medications and their 23 supplements. How this place for carbohydrates, I don't know. Anyway, um, I did get an email uh, from one of my patients, a guy by the name Bill, and he said, I'm creating my, <clears throat> my own electrolytes and purchasing them in bulk. And he asks specific questions of us. Uh, Redmond Real Salt, how much per day? Magnesium, which type, how much per day? Potassium, which type, how much per day? Good questions, good questions. And there aren't really, really great answers that I can depend on and say this is the absolute truth. Because we really don't know this. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody says, oh, you must have this. You must have this. So the first statement I'm going to make to you is eat food. Eat food. Eat food. And get some salt in. So on average, the salt that I prefer to use, and, and let's go through this a little bit, okay? What types of salts are there? There's sea salt. Regular sodium chloride from the sea, it's what sustained us for many, many years. The problem with sea salt right now, the way it's, the way it's produced from the sea, it often includes little microplastics and things that I don't necessarily want to put in my body. The Himalayan salt, you've got it, it's great, it's pink Himalayan salt, it should be from mines. The problem is that so much of the Himalayan salt is just regular sea salt, especially the cheap stuff that's been dyed pink comes from India, if it comes from China, be very, very cautious about that type of salt. Then there's black salt and green salt and a variety of algae penetrated salts. All good. The salt that I like, the salt that I like comes from ancestral mines. So these guys here, the Redmond Real Salt, it's the one that I use. Um, it's an ancient salt harvested from a Jurassic era. Jurassic era seabed deep within the earth, pretty much before humans existed, the time of dinosaurs. So you might be eating a little bit of dinosaur poop along, poop along with this. There are some impurities in there, but there's a little bit of clay, but it's basically straight mined salt from a seabed. And it's concentrated sodium chloride, but it also has a variety of other electrolytes in it. I mean, this folks is from the uh, uh, Redmond site. Right there is a list with the concentrations of all the variety of electrolytes in the salt. And, and let's face it, human beings are shoreline creatures. We evolved along shorelines. And in large part, yes, we drank fresh water, but we supplemented with marine uh, uh, salt. And this was before the word plastics existed. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of years ago, this Jurassic era salt, a little bit later, is the salt that we used. It's the salt we had access to, pure, clean seawater, as clean as it could be without contamination from what we humans have put into it, primarily the plastics. So that's what we're getting. And all the other so-called contaminants are healthy contaminants because those are the things that evolutionarily our body needed. And there is a variety of different things in this. Again, you can look at this list. You can look at it on their website. But that's what we look for. And obviously it fluctuates depending on, on where you're getting the, the salt from. But that, to my mind, is the right salt for my body. Now, on top of that, if 
you have specific conditions, there are a few things that you can try. Like, for example, I've got a bit of cold right now. So I may add some zinc to that. I'm not a big zinc fan. I'm probably not going to do that. But if you had a cold, if you had COVID, certainly it is worth trying. I don't buy into it. But certainly there's a plausible argument for that. I've discounted that in my own life. Then there are a whole bunch of magnesiums. And we check red blood cell magnesium levels on every patient at entry into our practice. We look at those magnesium levels. And I understand those magnesium levels. And it's very, very rarely low. But we do see significantly elevated levels when people over-supplement. So I, I caution you, be very cautious about too much is better. It isn't. There is a very narrow range in magnesium, red cell magnesium, between 5 and 6. I like it typically between 5 and five, 5 to 5.5 okay, micrograms per cent in the, in the red cells. It's red cell magnesium that reflects the magnesium in your cells. However, there are a variety of different combinations of magnesium that have been touted on the internet, that have been touted very heavily on the internet. And um, it's important to understand what these magnesiums do. So let's start with magnesium for your gut. The first one is magnesium oxide, malox. Okay. Those are antacids. Magnesium oxide is an antacid that is used primarily to calm your gut down, to calm the foregut down. It uh, uh, um, neutralizes acid and magnesium, chlor magnesium oxide is a very, very useful a reliever of heartburn and indigestion. It also will act as a laxative. So it may act as a short-term laxative for those of you that are converting to uh, a carnivore-type diet. You may have the trots, but you may also have constipation. Magnesium oxide may be helpful. A swig of, a swig of uh, Maalox uh, may work. However, I'm not a big fan of magnesium oxide unless you've got severe heartburn. And certainly on a carnivore-based diet, reflux goes away because you're not triggering GLP-1. That's for another visit. Uh, the next big GI one, which I use as a surgeon, when I'm doing a colonoscopy, when I'm doing a bowel prep on somebody because I'm working on their gut, I will use a particular magnesium product that primarily stays in the gut. And it can either be taken in capsule form or preferably as a liquid bottle, a little salty tasting. It's called magnesium citrate. So if you are taking magnesium citrate, the primary purpose of magnesium citrate is as a powerful laxative. It may cause a little bit of cramping of your gut, but I promise you, you will go. You will go. Okay. So magnesium citrate is one of the most powerful known laxatives out there. And one or two bottles, if you haven't gone for a while, and we'll talk about constipation. So don't, don't be purging. Don't be the anorexic that's purging all the time. But mag citrate is not well absorbed. It is primarily a laxative. So understand, look at the magnesium you're taking and make sure if you're using it for poopage, make sure it's magnesium citrate. If you're using it for absorption, don't go there. Then there's a series of other anions that are compounded with magnesium. And um, there are over 300 biochemical reactions in the human body, including muscle and nerve function, blood glucose control, red blood cell function, oxygen delivery, uh, blood pressure regulation that all require magnesium as a cofactor. So magnesium is important in the human body. And we've got to understand what the supplements do in terms of taking them in. I don't personally take any magnesium supplement. I do not take magnesium supplements. Okay. I've taken magnesium citrate prior to colonoscopy and believe me, <laughs> it worked. It worked. But other than that, for medicinal purposes, I do not take magnesium supplement. And I'm not certain that most of you are taking it. Oh, but I got this. Oh, but I got that. Try the magnesium. But if it doesn't work, don't keep taking it. So what are the magnesiums? The one that is most rapidly best absorbed, in my opinion, is magnesium glycinate or magnesium biglycinate. So for the absorptive side, it's highly absorbable. Magnesium glycinate. Now, everybody on the internet is going to say, oh, it's for the calming effect. It soothes the brain. It manages anxiety and depression and stress and insomnia. Eh. 
No, it's just an absorbable form of magnesium, okay? It's just a magnesium that goes into your belly, but it's well absorbed. So I like magnesium glycinate if you're looking at it for leg cramps, for brain function, for all the others. It's excellent. Then you've got the uh, magnesium lactate. Oh, it eases digestion. It eases heartburn as well. Great general. No, magnesium lactate, never used it, never prescribed it, won't use it. Magnesium chloride, bioavailability is good. Magnesium chloride is best used as a topical ointment for things like sunburn, okay? Don't, don't, don't put it in your mouth. Um, magnesium malate. Oh, this one's so good for fibromyalgia. Well, fibromyalgia is inflammation of your ligaments and tendons caused by sugar. Ask any type 1 diabetic. So fatigue, fibromyalgia, you'll get it pushed for that. Not so sure. Magnesium taurate, this calms the body, says all those folks. Calms the body, calms the mind, good for heart health. All right. Magnesium threonate, penetrates the blood-brain barrier, good for your brain. Okay, there it is. Choosing the right form of magnesium depends on your specific health needs, gastrointestinal sensitivity, and how well your body can absorb magnesium. Consult with a healthcare provider before starting any new supplement regimen. Um, but if I'm that guy, I'm going to say don't use it. Don't use it. I'm going to say get yourself an ancient salt. Plenty of magnesium in here. Doesn't have to be Redmond. That's how I get my magnesium in. I get it in my diet, folks. Oh, but my leg cramps. Oh, my... If it's magnesium and electrolytes that are causing your leg cramps, we got other problems. Oh, but I swear by them every time I take this. That's association. Yes, the electrolytes do affect muscle function. Absolutely. Leg cramps, muscle function. Top up your electrolytes. But you don't have to use it for years and years and years all the time. Eat correctly, correct your metabolic health, be physically active. And if those three things don't work, then let's talk electrolytes. But don't think electrolytes are a surrogate for those three things. Regular physical activity, didn't say exercise, regular physical activity, and a healthy diet and being insulin sensitive in ketosis, fat adapted ketosis. Eating a robust diet that gives you micro and macronutrients. Then you can add magnesium. Now, let's talk about something else. And I know I'm going to get a lot of flack for that, but that's the reality. How did we ever exist with, as a species without all these wonderful supplements from stores all over the country? Don't know. Okay. So the next one are the potassiums. And the reality is this, folks, 96% of the potassium in the human body is inside of the cells. 96% of the sodium in the human body is in the blood vascular space. And there are interchanges, there are co-transporters, sodium-potassium co-transporter, and they go to, to together or equal and opposite, and they transport things in and out of the cell. There's also a potassium, and, and again, when, you, when you're dealing with protons and electrons, you need potassium, you need uh, sodium, and you need chloride. You need bicarb to correct the acid-base balance. So all of these things work in conjunction. That's what electrolytes do. They are transport molecules. They are transport molecules uh, uh, across cell membranes to transport things into and out of the cell. Sodium chloride also manages blood pressure, blood volume, and also controls pH together with bicarb and hydrogen ions. But Potassium and glucose are an exchange, and as long as both levels are good, you're fine. You don't need to take a whole bunch of that. If you eat animal products, there's plenty of potassium in all the muscle tissue that you eat. So if you're mostly carnivore, you're eating a carnivore-based diet, you don't have to worry too much about, about potassium. Now, if you're, if you're on medication or something like that that's lowering your potassium, then certainly potassium chloride, potassium citrate, potassium bicarbonate, potassium gly uh, gluconate, which is the one I favor, those are all powerful forms of, of, of adding potassium back to your bloodstream. If you've had horrible diarrhea, take your electrolytes. If you've been sick, take your electrolytes. But you don't need them every day. Not in my opinion. 
If you're healthy, you really don't need them. Now, let's look at what the experts say, because I'm no expert, I'm just a doctor. <laughs> um, let's look at actually a very, very good response that came from Cheryl, my dietitian, or our dietitian. I'm not, she's not mine. Uh, she works with me. She's a colleague, but she works in our practice. Uh, a brilliant rendition. I, she's not as radical as I am. She says to this person that was inquiring about electrolytes and supplements, the dietary intakes are not necessarily grounded in the greatest science. Absolutely concur. The dietary intakes, the recommendations are not grounded in the greatest science. In fact, most of it is fables and magic and fairy tales, in my opinion. However, she says, typically, consensus is that we need about three times as much potassium as we do sodium. Eat a steak, eat an egg. The rationale is that this prevents hypertension and decreases the risk of cardiovascular disease. Well, so does meat. Particularly reduces the risk of stroke. That's the narrative. In a healthy individual, excess potassium is readily excreted or absorbed into the cells, and there is no upper limit in terms of safety. I would argue with that. I would argue with that, because the heart is heavily regulated by both potassium and sodium. And electrolyte abnormalities, not only potassium and, and sodium itself, but calcium and some of the other electrolytes that get affected by the concentrations of those two dominant electrolytes can definitely affect cardiovascular function. So be very cautious because one will displace the other. Ask anybody on a diuretic. So in healthy individuals, excess potassium is readily absorbed into cells. 96% of potassium lives inside of cells or readily excreted. But there is an upper limit. There is an upper limit, even though a lot of folks on the internet say, oh, there's no upper limit to potassium. Absolutely there is. And I've seen toxicity. I've seen those numbers go high. And even a slight elevation in potassium can cause profound cardiovascular effects. So be careful. I've seen it overdosed, both intravenously as well as orally. And this is where, and obviously those are sick people, and this is where Cheryl makes a very good point. If you are taking a COX-2 inhibitor or other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, you may need to consume less. Also of concern if you are taking medications that impair potassium excretion, such as the blood pressure medications, the ACE inhibitors, uh, ARBs, potassium-sparing diuretics like spironolactone. In this case, Less is important. As long as you're not taking any of these medications, I would recommend the following per day according to the Institute of Medicine Dietary Reference Intakes. Now remember, it's more magic than it is science. 3 to 5 grams of sodium, depending on your height, 7 to 10 grams, around 9 grams of potassium, and around 400 to 420 gra uh, milligrams of magnesium a day. Now, remember, you're going to be salting your food. Depending on the food you take in, it's also going to have other electrolytes in. Quite frankly, folks, my response is be healthy. Be healthy. Add salt to your food. I use the Jurassic era Himalayan salt. Doesn't matter what salt you use. Add salt to your food. It's going to be just fine. Just fine. And then the only time I really use electrolytes is after I exercise. At least once a day, I'm going to use my electrolytes. Dumb it down, folks. Be healthy so you don't need to take a whole bunch of things that supposedly makes you super healthy. Less is more. Argue with me. Roll the rants. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. I hope this logic helps.